We're going to go ahead and get started and welcome to this week's CyberHer conversation. My name is Katie Shuck. I am the Chief of Strategy for CyberHer. And with me, I have Kanthi Narukonda, who is CyberHer's Chief of Operations. She'll be doing our Q&A today with our amazing speaker that I'll introduce in just a second. I also want to recognize that Dr. Pam Rowland, who is with us, is one of CyberHer's co-founders, along with Dr. Ashley Podorotsky. She founded CyberHer back in 2013. And since then, we have reached over 20,000 girls in cybersecurity. So, but the reason that you all are all here today is to meet Dr. Gabriella Coleman from McGill University. She is the Wolf Chair in Scientific and Technological Literacy at McGill. She is also the founder and editor of Hack Curio, a video portal that is about the cultures of hackers. But what I think is most interesting in her bio that she sent me was she deals with the politics, culture, and ethics of hacking. If you've ever thought there's ethics in hacking, she is the person to go talk to because I'll tell you there is. Um, she is an anthropologist and author and just has done so many things and we are so glad to have her here with us. But before we begin with her too, I do want to remind you if you have questions, you can ask them at any time through the Q&A that you'll find at the bottom of the screen. And then Kanthi will get to those once Dr. Coleman has had a chance to speak. So Dr. Coleman, without further ado, I am going to hand it over to you. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Katie, Pam, Kanthi, um, Ashley, for inviting me and for just starting this program. I really believe in the efforts to draw more people in, so it's really exciting to contribute. So what I'm going to do is start with a short presentation. I've got some slides. And I'm going to get that going and then we'll move to the conversation. So, all right, here they are. And let me just start the slideshow. All right, hello world. Um, my name has already been introduced. I go by Gabriella Urbiella. And what I'm going to do today is give a bit of an introduction to myself, to uh, this term hackers, which some of you may be familiar with, and some of you may think of simply as sort of criminal people, but it's really a action in a world that's much broader than that, how I study them and who they are. So let's just start with anthropology, which is often a little bit mysterious to some people like, like hacking as well. And I love this tweet um, that says, you're an anthropologist, so like Indiana Jones or dinosaurs. Uh, well, like Taylor, I don't dig bones. I dig live people. Anthropology has different fields. There's cultural anthropology, which is what I do, the study of human culture. There's archaeology, such as Indiana Jones, which is the study of the past. There's linguistics, which is the study of language. And there's also biological anthropology, which is the study of primates. So as I noted, the group of people that I study are computer hackers. And um, hackers are known for hacking, which again can mean many different things. And one of the ways that I often like to start um, my presentations on hackers is to show actual hackers, because there's a lot, again, of mis uh, misrepresentations and stereotypes. And one of the best ways to sort of beat them down is to show the sorts of people that I've interviewed and studied which includes people like Katie Masuris, a security professional, to free software developers, to hacktivists, and those that are so into programming and hacking that they fall over sleeping on their computers. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I got to both anthropology and hacking, and then also define what hackers are and what they do in a kind of very general sense. But before I do that, I just want to talk about why they matter, what they've done. And again, there are criminal hackers and there's security professionals, including those white hat or gray hat hackers who protect against them. But hackers of the sort that I study have done many different things. They have changed the nature of journalism by providing whistleblowing platforms or helping with data journalism. They've hacked up um, and developed privacy tools. They've exposed surveillance. They have contributed to the security industry. They have contributed to the politics of access. They liberate information and software. 
They've changed the face of online protests. They've done biohacking and more. So there's a lot of work to do. And some of you, I hope, will be interested not only in doing security work, but maybe understanding hackers and how they contribute to these different facets of life. So this is me um, when I was a little kid. Some people often ask, well, did you get into hackers because you were a child hacker? Um, well, no, I was, I was nerdy, which I think the picture with the Pac-Man shirt uh, exemplifies. Uh, but I, I actually had no exposure to computers until much later. But one thing I did have was a mentor in high school, um, Deborah Ferdman, my high school teacher, who actually taught me anthropology, which again is the study of human life cultures. And, and I was really fascinated by anthropology. And it's something that even in high school, I knew I wanted to pursue. But certainly hackers uh, was not on the table it was not even on my radar, much less computers. So what happened? Well, I went to graduate school eventually. I did elementary, I did college, and I went to graduate school. And I was actually studying religious healing in the Caribbean. And uh, life had other plans for me. I ended up getting quite sick actually for a year. And I spent a whole year online at home, sort of like we're doing right now, really glued to the, to the computer. And one of the things that I learned about at the time was what was called, and still is called, free and open source software. And this is software that gives the user the freedom to share, study, and modify it. We call this free software because the user is free. The user has freedom. And at the time I was in grad school, I was really taken aback by how people who called themselves hackers uh, the idea of free software came from Richard Stallman, someone who very proudly carries the badge of, of hacking. I was really taken aback by how these engineers also created a legal framework to liberate knowledge. And I was at home and I just spent the entire year learning more and more and more about it. And I got hooked in and I decided, well, I'm gonna study hackers. So what's a hacker? What is hacking? Well, there's many different definitions. There's various traditions. It's what I study. It's, I teach a whole class on hackers, but I'd like to offer a definition by Saint Jude, Jude Milhorn. She's contributed many books regarding hacking and computer programming. And she provides this very nice uh, definition of a, of a hack, which is the clever circumvention of imposed limits whether imposed by your government, your own skills, or the laws of physics. And hackers often come up with clever solutions to get around those imposed limits. So a little bit about the history of the term hack. Originally, it came from MIT, one of the kind of great universities for engineering um, and technology work and computers. And, it, and a hack, one of the original meanings was a prank. And here is a very nice definition by Rob McMillan, a, a journalist who has worked on hackers for many years. And he notes, MIT hacks are creative, whimsical, and often completely difficult campus pranks orchestrated by anonymous students working with military precision in the dark of the night. So the term hack was born at MIT to designate these pranks, but it was also used by the engineers who were part of the tech model railroad club in the late 1950s. And those engineers who are willing to be creative or whimsical with their railroad model would refer to their interventions as hacks. And this is kind of where the term first came from and various um, computer enthusiasts who were like really, really obsessed with computers used the term hacker to describe themselves and what they did. There's other kind of traditions in the hacker world, and, and one I'm just going to mention briefly um, is phone freaking. And here I'm showing a picture of two of the more famous Steves in the technology world, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, who were phone freaks. There were individuals who either used um, their own voice or boxes in order to tap into the phone system 
it was illegal. They were often doing it to explore the system, to understand it, to improve the system. And many of these hackers, in fact, eventually um, started to do the same with computers and many of them also became security professionals. So let me just actually play a very short video that gives you an introduction to phone freaking, which was a tradition that then became underground computer hacking. Make their calls. In the days when calls went through to operators, phone freaking wasn't possible. But as human switchboards were replaced by mechanical systems, different noises were used to trigger the switches. If you had perfect pitch like blind phone freak Joe and Grecia, you could whistle calls through the network. Let's see if I make it this time. He even showed off his skills for the local media. From his one phone to a town in Illinois and back to his other phone, a thousand mile phone call by whistling. Join Grecia. So this video is one that I use in, in my teaching. I use lots of videos and eventually I decided to liberate these videos, which I'll talk about in a moment. But now to start wrapping up, let me just talk a little bit about the work I've done. Make their call. The first project uh, that I did was on the free and open source software movement. Again, these are programmers, many of them refer to themselves as hackers who, who don't believe in copyrights and patents and they liberate their software using alternative legal regimes. And this is me um, during a protest that many free software developers uh, attended. This research tended to be in person, actually. They are not hackers that are in the shadows. My separate, second project dealt with the hacktivist collective known as Anonymous. And unlike the free software hackers and developers, they did exist in the shadows. Most of the research I did was online on internet relay chat and other online spaces. I um, eventually met people involved in Anonymous after some of them had been arrested. And again, many of these individuals consider themselves hacktivists who were engaging in um, direct action and other forms of activism online. So that is done. And a current project has to do with some non-malicious underground hackers. So hackers who broke into systems or pushed legal boundaries and they were often doing it to explore and to learn about these systems. And many of them actually came of age at a time when there weren't many computer science departments working on security. And they held the knowledge to both uh, break into computers but also improve security. And many of these non-malicious underground hackers eventually came out of the shadows, decided to fight for security and had to convince both academics and the industry that they were legitimate security researchers. And that is my current project and it tracks how they did that work of credibility building to become key in the industry. And finally, one other project which I'm engaged in is a hacker video museum where I collect short little videos. I ask contributors to write something about the videos the videos all have to do with hacking. And the purpose of this project is multifold, one of which is just to pre preserve some history, but it's also to break stereotypes around hacking and show that there's many different traditions and ways to hack. So just to finish, um, I'm gonna pose this question, what can you do with social science knowledge about hackers and security? I think you can do many things. Um, including working in the security industry, working for nonprofits, working for um, organizations that are building privacy tools and more. But this is a question I will pose in case you want to kind of pose it back to me in a more specific way. So I'm going to stop my um, slides and go back um, to the group. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. That was exciting. You know, when I first heard that you were an anthropologist, um, there's a TV series called Bones. Um, she's a forensic anthropologist. It's my favorite show ever. And I was like, wait, like Bones? And then I'm like, no, she's, she's working in cyber. So 
right right it's still so amazing to be able to study how cultures and how people interact how groups of people interact with each other it must be exciting it is exciting and i like the fact that you mentioned the group element you know oftentimes in popular culture whether it's uh, Mr. Robot or the movie War Games, which is an older movie from the early 1980s. Oftentimes, media representations about hackers really focus in on the individual. And there are many remarkable individuals, but they're really collectivists and they really work in groups. And it's fascinating to understand how they work in a group and how they collaborate. So true, because most of the times, like you mentioned, we only see individuals, how they're working towards something or how they've asked or maybe reached out to someone, just one other person, not even a group, to help them with their cause. But I don't think that's the reality. When you look at um, advanced persistent threats, there are groups of hackers working together from many different places. They're all coming together for a common cause, for the lack of a better word. (laughs) No, absolutely. And, you know, even academics, I often spend many lonely days and nights at my desk um, figuring out problems and puzzles. But if it weren't for the fact that I was reading books and learning from others, I couldn't do my work. But I think hacking and hackers and security work is deeply collaborative, in part because of the complexity of the problems, right? So there's a lot of specialization and you have to kind of, you know, it, it requires going to others to get help. Um, and I think there's, it's also very pleasurable to be part of little collectives and groups to move forward with a goal or solve a problem as well. Um, since we were just talking about hack of representations on TVs and stuff, we have a question from our audience. Um, what's your favorite movie or TV show that has an accurate depiction of a hacker? Great question. Um, so there's various that I like. I will emphasize or mention two of them. One is a little bit of an old school movie called Sneakers. And it also is really related to sort of security and it's a a group of hackers who are sort of being framed and they're able to kind of outwit um, that situation and also stop some bad guys in the process. And what I like about it is precisely that it's a group of people who have to work together in order to solve the problem. And then another film that I really like, which is a little bit harder to access, it's called Who Am I? No System is Safe. And it's a German film that was released maybe four years ago. And it portrays four hackers, a hardware hacker, a security hacker, a social engineer, and a programmer who also are working together. And I'm not going to um, talk about what happens because um, I'll spoil the plot line. But again, I like the fact that it's four of them who work together and it's technically very different types of people. And it also has a lot of Easter eggs, um, historical Easter eggs. There's lots of references to things that actually happened in the world of hacking and its history. And whoever made the film um, put those in, in the film. So hackers who know that history or the anthropologist who knows that history could be like, oh, I know what reference you're talking about. We're going to have to really look into that German movie. Thank you for that. Um, you've mentioned that you've researched or you've had interviews with um, hackers uh, from Anonymous and otherwise. So who's the coolest or the most interesting hacker that you've met? If you're we don't need a name, just right. maybe tell us what they did. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to talk about any individual, but what I am going to say is that what I like about the hacker world is actually, even though uh, like the security world and like many different domains of hacking, it's very oriented towards the male world, right? And this is what is so wonderful about this project, um, is that actually I've met a lot of people with very different backgrounds. Um, and, and they come from very different walks of life. And I'll give some examples and got to computers in very different ways, right? And I think that's um, always really important. And it's always great to hear those stories because it inspires others to go, oh, maybe I can do this as well. And in the case of Anonymous, 
um, for example, I was interacting with a number of the hackers who were breaking into systems that were doing uh, quite illegal things, often in the service of exposing corruption, sometimes for fun, sometimes to expose bad security. And they were faceless to me. I didn't know who they were. And in fact, I thought many of them were young, extremely privileged and, and white men. That was the image in my head, even though I had met many hackers not in that vein. And when a number of them got arrested, I was surprised to see that you had a number of people like Mustafa Al-Bassam, who came from an immigrant community. He was Iraqi, he was finishing up high school. Um, and eventually he, in fact, went to um, University College London, uh, or is it King's College? An esteemed university in London and got a PhD in cryptography, right? And so it's always a good reminder that, you know, there are very kind of surprising people who, who come to the security and hacker world. So what, what's your favorite part about your job? Is it connecting interviews or research or teaching? I think the two favorite parts are research um, there's always more than meets the eye. And I think that's something very similar between social science research, whether it's anthropology or political science and security research, right? You know, for example, with security, there's maybe a hack and doing that forensic work is puzzle solving. It's no different when uh, you're doing anthropological research, right? When you're trying to understand, wait, why is it that a group of people came together and created new licenses to liberate information, how did this happen, right? And how also do they actually collaborate together to produce a complicated piece of software like Linux or Firefox? It's really never straightforward and it's so thrilling to talk to people and put that puzzle together. So research, awesome. Teaching, also very, very wonderful precisely because um, you know, students are like sponges, they want to learn, they want to understand things, they also challenge us to think differently about certain topics. And so that's a huge thrill. I think writing is the hardest part, putting it all together so that uh, the public or peers can understand what what you do. And that's always probably the most challenging part. I would agree with you on the writing part. <laughs> I am currently putting together a research proposal. I sent it to my advisor. She knew what I meant. I knew what I meant, but she was like, you know what, let's phrase it this way so everybody can understand. And I think that's a really hard no, skill. <laughs> exactly, and I've actually talked to a lot of technical people and programmers who emphasize, you know, sure, a piece of software, a piece of code can always be better, or I could do it differently, but you know when it works, you know when it works, right? Whereas with writing, there's always that ambiguity. You're like, I think it works for me, but maybe it doesn't work for someone else. Or worse, sometimes you write A, but someone else understands B, right? So there's always a, a kind of ambiguity and frustration that comes with writing that even you know technical people, when it comes to programming, don't necessarily have the same experience. Although there's very different frustrations that also come with technical work. Very true, very true. Um, so coming back to your research what you um interviewed the hackers so you i mean we know you have to keep their names uh secret or private so how do you then indicate that or doesn't get doesn't it get hard to keep the, those people anonymous when you're discussing about them that's a, that's a great question and it allows me to revisit a point um, that I was making in my presentation and that is really important with Hack Curio is that there's very different types of hackers and questions of secrecy and anonymity matter in different ways to different ones. So free and open source software hackers and developers um, build their world around openness and transparency. So there it was very easy to gain their trust they were often okay if I used their names. They would talk to me for 10 hours. You know, it was very straightforward. Anonymous was much, much harder. I had to gain people's trust as long as people had not been revealed, let's just say by state authorities, 
I had to keep them anonymous. I didn't know who, who they were. I had to also um, really turn to the world of security to secure my data. And I was quite uh, paranoid and, and stressed <laughs> often when it came to that research. Finally, with my third project on um, former uh, non-malicious black hats who now are central in the security industry, one of the reasons I could do the project now is that it's a historical project and the statute of limitations for any possible crimes has passed, so they're more willing to talk. But there still I have to be very sensitive. For all three projects, I have to go through um, a human subjects approval where I, I write an application, I talk about how I will protect individuals if they need protection, what I will do, and, and get that approval. And so it's a good reminder that we always have to think about the people we're working with. And again, these different groups have sort of different needs or histories around secrecy and not anonymity, which makes my own research more difficult or more straightforward. Um, I kind of have two questions for you that are interrelated. So what, what has been the best part or the most exciting moment of your career? If you had to pick one singular moment, what would that be? I think one of the thrills of my uh, research has been going to large hacker conferences. So two of the, the big ones are the Chaos Computer Club. They hold a yearly conference at the end of December with up to 20,000 people. DEF CON, which is a big security conference in August, has up to 30,000 people. Hackers on Planet Earth every two years is a big conference in New York City. And I actually think presenting my research to the hacker world has been both the most frightening thing and the most Satis the most satisfying thing as well. So presentations at each one of those conferences, DEF CON, CCC, and HOPE have probably been one of the great highlights of my research. And another great thing is these talks are online um, and available to anyone as well. So then what's the most boring part <laughs> of your job or of being a hacker? I mean, for, for hackers, oh, well, you know, I think um, my answer will pertain to both our worlds is um, maintenance, right? So I think for, for security research or hacking, it's really fun to come up with a very clever solution or solve a problem. There's a kind of moment of glory around that. But often good security just requires maintenance, upkeep, updating, um, if you're more on the programming side to follow certain protocols, it's kind of boring and tedious work, but so, so important, right? And the same thing with sort of academic work. While the interviews are so exciting or presenting the work is so exciting, if you don't do the slow work of collating and categorizing your data and tagging it um, and doing all the kind of necessary work to again, put it in a certain place and categorizing it and, and kind of upkeeping it, you're not able to do good work and it's often quite boring as well. So say there's someone who's interested more in learning about hacking or how they get to be ethical hackers, what advice do you have? Are there any resources that you recommend that they follow? So absolutely, one of which is to, um, visit the websites for uh, DEF CON or Black Hat, which is the kind of more corporate conference that goes with, with DEF CON or uh, Chaos Computer Club, uh, which goes beyond the world of security, but there's a lot of security issues. All these conferences publish their talks and I would um, watch the ones that are in your interest field, you will learn a lot. They're really exciting. And they also will teach you a lot about the culture and ethics of hacking, um, how to do it ethically, what the history is. So that's one area. I'll also plug my website, Hack Curio, um, which is meant to introduce people to these different topics. It is a work in progress, so there's still a lot more. And then finally, once this pandemic is over, if you're truly interested, try to go to a meetup 
or a hacker conference and, and meet other people and start interfacing with the community. Um, our last question to you, Dr. Coleman. What advice do you have for the young people that are watching this session right now? You know, I think something that's really important is first of all, if you have, um, if your instinct is telling you to follow a certain path, uh, go for it and seek mentors and others who can help guide you. I think that's really, really important. I know even for myself, when I decided to turn to computer hacking as a young anthropologist, everyone at the time was saying, that's not what a young anthropologist does. Uh, they work on more traditional topics. And it was only by talking to uh, mentors and others that I had the kind of courage to move forward. So that's one element. The other element is I think the question of imposter syndrome kind of never goes away. You know, the more you learn, the less you feel like you know. And it's always a good reminder, or you should remind yourself that many others are in that state as well. And it's okay to feel like even as you've learned a lot that there's more to learn. And again, that you need to go to others um, to ask for help and guidance to kind of keep growing and learning and pushing against that little devil in your head that says, oh, no, no, you don't belong here. No, you do belong here, even if there's a lot more to learn. Thank you so much for all of those words that you shared with us on the just the culture of hackers and all of your work. It's just to me so fascinating. I am going to launch a poll for all of our attendees. If you can fill that out, just let us know a little bit of information about um, where you're coming from and whether or not you enjoyed this, this conversation. We're always looking for ways to improve our conversations. I also want to um, welcome you to come back next week as we feature Tanya Janka, who is also known as She Hacks Purple. She is the founder of We Hack Purple, an online learning academy that focuses on um, creating secure um, applications She's also the author of Alice and Bob Learn Application Security. You can follow us, though, on our social media. Subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find our previously recorded conversations, and this conversation will be added there shortly. You can also check out our website for all of our programs that we offer, including our one that you can register for right now if you're a high school student. It's our Gen Cyber Girls in Cyber Security Camp. It'll begin in February, but registration is going on right now. It is free and sponsored through the National Security Association. We are so grateful again for you to come with us, Dr. Coleman, and, and just help us inspire the future of cybersecurity. Uh, we know that great things are going to happen. We thank all of you who are able to join us live, and we hope that you'll be able to come back if, or join us live if you're watching this recording on our YouTube channel. So thank you and have a great day.